So hello everybody. So today we only have uh, one talk. So the talk will be by Florent Renault, who is a researcher at Lund Observatory in Sweden. So he's working on galaxy formation and evolution. And the talk is about large scale galactic dynamics. So uh, ask the question on the Slack channel. So I will take, ask the question at the end of his talk. And then if you want to interact with him directly, you can switch to the coffee room after the talk. So enjoy. Right, thank you very much, Patrice. And thanks a lot to the organizer for this fantastic work and for putting uh, so many people from so many different countries of the world together, uh, talking about the ISM of galaxies. So indeed today I will focus on the galactic dynamics with the perspective of uh, simulations, which doesn't mean that we will not talk about observations, but uh, mostly focusing on simulation work in the last, uh, in the last years. So uh, let me start with the obligatory disclaimer that uh, saying it's impossible to cover this topic in full in two hours, really impossible. Uh, so the lecture instead aims at being a starting point for you to explore more the field and the different aspects I will talk about in more details on your own. And uh, of course, everything I'm gonna talk about is based on my personal interest and also with my own work to illustrate the point I'm gonna make. So the slides are, I think, already available online. Uh, there should, you should have a link or maybe a PDF file already. Uh, so there will be some uh, supplementary material at the end for you. If, you. if you don't know all the concept I'm going to talk about, you can go there and get some information uh, in addition. And you have also some mathematical der derivations for a, a few uh, key quantities that we're going to talk about. So let's start by uh, going from small scales to large scales. And for me, small scales is what you see on the left is probably closer to what you have heard from most of this uh, summer school, which is the interstellar medium inside a molecular cloud or insta inside the star forming regions. And if you observe this, the star formation process seems to appear to be universal. You see this filamentary structure in all the clouds with what is more or less a constant or universal diameter of uh, something like uh, uh, 0 0.1 parsec. You have extension threshold, which also seems to be universal. And if you look for pre-stellar cores, you will see them in the knots along the filaments. Uh, for cluster, it's they're more likely to be found at the intersection of the filaments when you get a higher density over a larger volume. And again, if you look in, into uh, clear details about individual stars, you will see what appears to be a universal initial mass function for the star, so the MF, uh, something close to, to what uh, Chabrier or Krupa uh, formalism shows. All this is nice, convenient, and easy, um, but this universality is observed actually where it can be resolved which means basically in the solar neighborhood, so very close to us, to Earth, uh, which mean one single environment when you have one set of uh, physical conditions. However, if you go further, already in the Milky Way, if you go to the galactic center, or if you go to other galaxies uh, further away, then things are different. And uh, we start to question this universality that we observe in the solar neighborhood. So for example, you can have different formation of clusters, you can form massive clusters in other galaxies. You can, there are more and more hints that the initial mass function varies, maybe uh, because of um, metacity or be, because of different uh, turbulence mode. And also we see a clear role of these structures like the spiral arms and the bars. I think uh, M83, so the top right uh, image here, it's a very nice example. You see all these star forming regions along the spiral arms there. Uh, below is the picture of the antennae galaxy, so local mergers of two galaxies that uh, change really the way star formation proceeds. The, the intensity, the, the amount of star, the rate at which the stars are formed. And this uh, is even uh, more complicated if you go to in the early universe to high redshift, where galaxies are, are very complicated shapes. Basically, your, your nice looking disk galaxy is not in place yet. So all these things together make us question the universality of star formation. If we have really a diversity of environment for, for, for star formation, different physical conditions for star formations. So uh, I think you have seen that earlier in the week, uh, maybe, maybe David Elba showed you this, so that the, 
the classic Madao plot showing the evolution of the star formation activity in the universe across time. So redshift on the x-axis, look back time at the top if you, if you prefer. And on the y-axis, what you have is the star formation. So the amount of stars formed per unit of time, per unit of co-moving volume, so basically compensating for the expansion of the universe. And what we see is that uh, from the observations from, from the data point, it's really, really far from being constant or, or, or even monotonic. We have a peak at redshift uh, around two. What make these shapes is a combination of many different factors, like the galaxy mergers. Uh, we know they can trigger star bursts, and we know they are less and less frequent because of the expansion of the universe. The density of the universe goes as one plus redshift cubed. So uh, simply because of the expansion, you get less and less frequent galaxy mergers and interaction. Also, for typically for Milky Way-like galaxy, the disk is not in place before redshift around four. So you don't have your nice looking galaxy all the time. And that's even more true for the substructure in the disk, like the spirals and the bar. It takes time for them to form. Sometimes they're destroyed, they need to reform again, etc. On a, in addition to that, you have a constant, almost constant lowering of the gas fraction in your galaxy that change the physical conditions. And you also lower the level of turbulence with time. So all this combined, in a, in a very complex way and not fully understood way, but we know empirically that the star formation rate density peaks at redshift around two. And this is really important to keep in mind. Uh, this is statistically speaking. So it's not for an individual galaxy, but it's really for the uh, uh, representative fraction of the universe, basically. So on average, most galaxies are forming less and less stars uh, with time. All this is connected to the way we deal with uh, gas with baryons basically in your galaxy and what is usually referred to as a baryonic cycle. So because it's cycle, you have to, to start somewhere. So I choose to start as inflow of gas uh, to, toward the galaxy. In a kind of complicated way, this gas will eventually, can eventually end up in molecular clouds. Then the clouds uh, fragment, collapse, form stars, stars evolve, inject feedback, and then these gases kind of feed back, fed back to, to the interstellar medium in a quite complicated way. It will take a, a different path or different time scales to go back to the stage of molecular cloud and star forming material. And also part of this gas can also be ejected from the galaxies in the form of outflows. So all this tells you that the recycling of gas, typically the ingredient for star formation, is really set at the galactic scale. And therefore, if we want to understand galaxy formation in general and the interstellar medium of galaxies, we first need to answer these quite basic but very fundamental questions. So how much gas is available in the galaxy? Where is this gas? Is it uh, around the galaxy, in the corona, in the circumgalactic medium, in between the spiral arms, in the spiral arms, in clouds, et cetera, et cetera? in which physical stage, state sorry, is the galaxy, so what the density, what the temperature, how uh, far away from being star forming it is, and also how and how fast this physical state changes uh, with time. So with these uh, four questions, that seems relatively simple to answer, but it, it's not because all these are, are connected together, all these are coupled. If you answer that, I think you solve a good deal of modern astrophysics. So to give you an idea and put some numbers in that, uh, we, I will use, of course, every galaxy is different, but I will use typical values for Milky Way like galaxy. So starting in the top left with the intergalactic or circumgalactic medium, you have the infall of gas into your disk galaxy, something like one solar mass per year. Then part of this gas, over complicated and long time scale will end up forming stars. Again, for the Milky Way, the value is quite debated, but it's a few solar masses per year. Then stars evolve, as you know, some of them uh, will, uh, will die and, and have a stellar remnants in the form of a black hole, white dwarf neutron stars, etc. And the, the mass budget for this is a few solar masses per year of stellar remnant. But uh, other galaxies will have time to eject basically the outer layers of their atmosphere 
or even quite a, a large deal and not even leave a stellar remnant. So you will have this stellar feedback into the interstellar medium, something like one solar mass per year in the form of winds, of planetary nebula, of supernovae, etc. And uh, sometimes the feedback from stars, from different stars combined together, get a bit more energetic and can actually leave the galaxy in the form of galactic winds. And for the Milky Way, that's relatively small. That's less than a uh, solar mass per year. So now if you put all these numbers, even if they are rough estimates, if you put all these numbers together, you see that the Milky Way is actually losing uh, gas. The mass of gas is, is decreasing. And uh, from, uh, from a series of arguments, you can, you can find that the depletion time of the Milky Way, so the time it will take to run out of gas, is uh, a few billion years. And it's, it's quite a typical value for um, disk star forming galaxies. So now to, to understand in what state the gas is, what is the physics, uh, the physical condition of the gas, we can plot a phase diagram. So here I put a, a plot an example from Marinacci et al. So that's from a simulation. That's relatively easy to do in simulation. But of course, it depends on the physics that you put in your simulation and the resolution to capture this, this actual physics. So what you have on the x-axis is density of gas. On the y-axis, you have the temperature. And what you see here are the most generic features of a galactic uh, uh, system. So here, basically, if we start at the top left, so diffuse and hot gas, that the hot coronal gas basically around your galaxies coming from cosmological uh, scales and also from galactic winds. Now, if you apply uh, atomic cooling or even free-free cooling to this gas, you can get quite easily down to a 10 to the 4K. And you see this horizontal line, which shows an isothermal uh, regime, which basically corresponds to what is in between the spiral arms in the, in the spiral galaxy. If you want to go below in temperature, atomic cooling is not efficient enough, so you need to invoke molecular cooling. And this is what, uh, how you get to the unstable phase, the, 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 the competition between pressure and cooling, and how you form the clouds, the molecular clouds that will host star formation. So star formation, in principle, happens at very, very high densities. But in simulation, you don't capture this, uh, these densities. So in this case, for example, it's uh, something like 10 to the 7 atom per cubic centimeter these materials become stars in the simulation. And of course, the stars have feedback and retrocede some of these gas, eat up the gas and push the gas, diffuse the gas. So you, you populate back this top left corner and also this little uh, area here, which corresponds to the H2 region, so ionized hydrogen from photoionization. So you see, again, a kind of a cycle in this, uh, in this phase diagram uh, between all the process that we have to take into account. It's not so simple to understand the full picture because it's, I would say, it's, it's almost a definition of a multi-scale and multi-physics topics. Uh, if we start from larger scale with cosmological structure down to the smallest uh, object, of, for example, what's, what matters for star cluster evolution, here I give you orders of magnitude for time scale and space uh, scales. Uh, and below here, I have uh, highlighted what I consider to be the very important physical processes active at these scales into making the transformation of, of the gas into forming stars, etc. Starting with gas inflows from large-scale cosmology, galaxy mergers, outflows, galactic winds, the turbulence of the gas is incredibly important, shear, magnetic fields, stellar evolution, stellar feedback, and almost at all scales, uh, gravity and tides are playing a very important role. So maybe your favorite mechanism or your favorite uh, uh, aspect is not covered here. Uh, what, what I put here is really what I think is the main drivers of the global evolution of your, of your gas and of your galaxy. So then if we need to address this multi-physics uh, and multi-scale topic, why using simulations? If we compare to the observation, the simulation can provide more information in the sense of you can access time really easily. You can see the evolution of things. And having a real-time uh, evolution of, uh, of uh, in observation is really limited. So you have a few astrometry with Gaia. You see the motion of stars near the galactic center. You see also some uh, fast explosions of supernovae, but that's more or less it. Uh, with simulation, it's so easy to go back in time and see where these things come from, where these things end up 
uh, in, etc. You also have very easy access to the 3D space structure. And you're not even limited in 3D. You can measure many quantities, including the dynamical quantities, which are usually quite difficult to access from the observation, like the mass or the acceleration of things. And I would say that except in the Milky Way, and maybe actually only except in the solar neighborhood, you get a higher resolution in simulation than in observations in what you can measure. Of course, if you speak about the physical process in observations, the, the resolution is infinite because you have all the physical process taking place and what you put in your simulation is at a fixed resolution, but you can measure things at higher resolutions. Uh, you also have the control on the initial and the boundary condition of your system, which is good. It's always good to have control, but it's also bad because uh, basically you can, it's, it's really dependent on, on how careful you are or what kind of mistakes you want to do or oversimplification. So that's why I think, and I will never spread that enough, that simulation are and should always be considered as expensive experiments. Simulations are not made to reproduce the universe. If you are interested in observing something, go to a telescope, not a computer. And simulations are really here to, to try to simplify the reality and to help the interpretation of complex physical phenomena and also of the interplay of these phenomena, how they work together in making something quite complex. So uh, in the, the, the really difficult part in this simulation job is really to link the result of your simulation, which is artificial, part of arbitrary, etc. You want to link these back to reality to explain the reality. And this, I would say, the heart of the job of a simulator. But in short, and I put it in black, italic, underline, I should have made it blink, uh, never trust a computer. A computer does exactly what you ask it to do. So uh, don't trust a computer. To me, you know, artificial intelligence is, is kind of a very bad term because it's basically trying everything until it works. <laughs> to me, that's the definition of stupidity, but never trust a computer and really try to understand what you are doing and also what you are not doing with your simulation. So this being said, we can still use these fantastic tools that are simulations in different contexts and to answer different types of questions. And that's why we have several types of galaxy simulation because of different interest in the physics, but also because of technical limitation. So I will illustrate that with a few examples here. And we start with the cosmological volume. So here you see a picture from the New Horizon simulation by Dubois et al earlier this year. Uh, typically here you want to simulate a large chunk of the universe. So the size of your simulation volume is several 10 megaparsec. And the resolution you can reach with modern supercomputers is a few hundred uh, parsec, maybe one kiloparsec for uh, simulations like Eagle or Illustris. It's uh, around uh, one kiloparsec. So the good point of the good aspects of this type of simulation is that you have fantastic initial conditions because it's a cosmic microwave background, it's well constrained, and you have tons of galaxies. Basically, every little dot you see in this picture is a galaxy or proto galaxy. So you can do statistics on this population of galaxies. But it comes at the cost. Uh, the negative point is that you have a poor resolution in describing important physics like star formation and feedback that regulate the formation of your galaxy. And also because, you know, a few hundred parsec, you barely resolve your galactic disk. Uh, the, the disk scale height for the Milky Way is 100 parsec, maybe 200 parsecs. So if you have one or two resolution elements, one or two particles or one or two cells to describe that, you're not really resolving this. And that, therefore, you miss a lot of the physical process. So it's, if for you, it's really important to get this right, then you can increase the resolution, but of course it has to come at a price. And this is what we have done with uh, Oscar Agertz with the Wintergarten simulation here. So that's uh, an example of the cosmological zoom-in simulation. The size of your box is much smaller. It's about one or few megaparsec. Uh, but what you compromise on the size, you get back in the resolution with typical resolution now of a few 10 parsec. So here you have just a smaller piece of the cosmological volume typically. So you still have the good initial conditions. And because of higher resolution, you can capture the giant molecular cloud, the sites for star formation. Problem is of course you get only one galaxy, or I would say one galaxy and its satellites. You see here Milky Way-like galaxy and a few of its satellites about to merge with it. 
you don't fully resolve the internal physics of the giant miracle cloud at 10 parsec resolution. And because your galaxy is taking a large part of your volume, basically you have high resolution everywhere, you have particles everywhere. So it could be very expensive to run. So you need a quite powerful supercomputer to do this kind of simulations. If we continue on the compromise on the, on the size and, and getting better resolution, then the next uh, type of simulation would be to, to simulate isolated galaxies. So neglecting the cosmological aspects, you just put a galaxy there and you see how it evolves. So you can get the size down to a few hundred kiloparsecs, maybe 100 kiloparsecs is actually enough. And uh, you can reach quite high resolution. You can reach a third parsec regime in resolution. The, the good thing is that you can really control the parameter. You can make the exact galaxy that you want, the correct mass, the correct bulge to total, if it has a disk or not, et cetera, et cetera. And it can be relatively cheap to run if you are not too uh, eager on resolution. The big problem is that you don't have a realistic environment. You're missing the mergers within the other galaxies. You don't have gas accretion from basically all cosmological aspects are missing. And you start with the galaxy you put in. So you rely on artificial initial conditions. That could be a big problem, a big uh, uh, arbitrary aspect. And of course, if you push the resolution a lot, it could be very expensive to run. This is, I think, actually the most expensive type of resolution of uh, galaxies if you really go for subparsic regime. So uh, the alternative to that is to do the same, but only for a chunk of your galaxy in the galaxy patch. So here you see an example from the Tigress uh, suite of simulation, but maybe um, Eva Stryker will tell you a bit more about that uh, tomorrow, I think. Uh, so what you do here is basically the same as you're in, in isolated galaxies, but just for say one, one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec piece of your disk, you can have a large column above and below the plane of the disk to see how uh, feedback eject the gas away from the disk. So much smaller uh, size, and in principle, you could increase the resolution, but what is done in practice, it seems that you don't really increase the resolution, but you do more than one simulation. You really explore different recipes, different sets of initial conditions and see uh, how it affects the results. So the good part, uh, the, the good aspect of this type of simulation is that it's relatively easy to set up. It's cheap to run because you're not pushing so much of resolution and you still have a small volume. Bad thing is that you still have only one piece of a disk. You're missing a lot of aspects from the disk dynamics that uh, I will talk about later. You impose the instability that you want uh, in this particular piece of the galaxy. And, and because you cannot really push the resolution too much, you don't have a huge, huge advantage compared to isolated galaxy. So I would say that uh, if you have a big enough supercomputer, then why not going for the full disk? So that's, that's why I'm not uh, doing Galaxy Patch myself. But I see an, an advantage of trying different recipes. And the last type of simulation I want to mention are not really Galaxy simulations, but they are box of ISM, so cube of the ISM, when you put some gas and you see how it evolves. So here the size is, is actually smaller than 100 parsec resolution. You can go crazy with resolution with subparsec, milliparsec even and you can have a very, very high resolution. And you have a very good control on the parameter because you re-put the density, uh, the, the metacity, the, all the properties that you want in this box. Big problem for this, when you, you try to connect this to galactic uh, astrophysics is that you don't have the re realistic gas recycling. The flows of gas in and out your volume are, are not realistic. And you don't have any aspects, uh, any, any effects of the galaxy itself. So you don't get the gravitational potential, you don't get the turbulence, you don't get the shear, you don't get the tides, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why this type of simulation is really useful to understand gas physics, but it's very difficult to link this back to galactic physics or to disk physics. So as you see here in these uh, five generic families of galaxy simulation, uh, there is no there is not an obvious choice that you should go for this one. All of them have pro and cons, and it really depends on what type of physical question you are interested in and what numerical resources, what computer resources you have, uh, how big your supercomputer is, basically. So that's why there is, not, there is no uh, a good or bad choice for, for whatever you're doing. But uh, that also tells you that with different aspects and, and different compromise, the large case, 
kiloparsec scales. Uh, typically matters for the small scales in terms of medium and process as small as injection of feedback or, or star formation. We have actually several evidences of that already from the observations that the interstellar medium at small scales is connected to kiloparsec uh, physics. One easy example of this is the formation of young stars and star clusters, which is preferably found in spiral arms. It's striking in, in I would say, any observation of a, of a disk galaxy. Uh, face on, you see a, a strong connection between spiral arms and star and star cluster formation. If we want to be a bit more uh, uh, going more into depth, then we can look at the, the bar and we have special physical conditions in the bar that induce a diversity of star formation activity with respect to that side of the bar, but also inside of the bar, you have quite a diversity. You have giant molecular associations, so huge molecular clouds at the tip of the bar, like for example, W43 is observed at the tip of the Milky Way. And this could be probably, possibly the formation of sites of the massive cluster. So maybe this is where the Milky Way is forming its last massive cluster in the mass range of globular clusters, but much younger. Uh, there is also the problem, I would say, of the central molecular zone. So the inner, say, 300 parsec around the galactic center, when you have tons of molecular gas, uh, but which uh, shows weak star formation. And the reason for that is probably a very uh, destructive uh, large scale dynamics, like shear, for example, that, uh, that's uh, smooth out over densities. And at the very, very center of your galaxy, you have the assembly of the nuclear star cluster that also depends on large scale dynamics. Now, if we want to go more general and talk about molecular clouds, we know there are turbulence. And we also know from basic physics that turbulence dissipate over a few million years within a typical cloud, within the typical density of a cloud. So this means that the turbulence must be maintained. And it could be, it is maintained from feedback from the young stars in the form of wind, supernovae, all this um, uh, mechanical uh, energy can be converted into turbulence. It's, a, it's a actually a very important source of turbulence. But the big problem with this is we also see stars, uh, sorry, clouds without stars, maybe before they form stars, which are turbulent. So no feedback in them, and you still have turbulence, which means that at least part of the turbulence must be injected at larger scales than within the clouds. It must come from kiloparsec scales. The possible sources for that are still debated, but probably related to the differential rotation of the disk. Uh, the accretion of gas onto your galaxy and, and things like that. So if we want to look at this problem a bit more in, in more details, so what we want to explain is that we have stars. So I think solar radius is 10 to the minus uh, seven parsec. Density is 10 to the 24 atom per cubic centimeter. And they form in giant molecular clouds, which are 10 to 100 parsec, 100 atom per cubic centimeter. Basically, we want to explain uh, density increased by 22 orders of magnitude. That's huge. How do we do that? Well, there is the little problem that if you, if you observe clouds, you see only stars younger than 10 million years within clouds. So that tells you that the lifetime of giant molecular cloud is about 10 million years. Okay, be careful. This is true in the solar neighborhood in where we can really well resolve them well but maybe not for all clouds, uh, in particular in between the spiral arms in galaxy merger that a high rate shift that might be very different. So this is still under investigation. We also know that the free fall time of cloud, so for a spherical system, it's square, uh, the square root of uh, three pi over 32 G rho. So if you put the, the constant there, you get 4 million years for the typical density of a cloud, so 100 atom per cubic centimeter. So what does that mean? That means that your time scale, the lifetime for a giant molecular cloud is longer than the free fall time. Simple conclusion, the clouds are not in free fall. Fine, so you need support against the collapse. We need some pressure support, but also turbulence support. The other argument for that comes from stability criterion. When you look at the mass of a giant molecular cloud, it's much, much bigger than the genes mass of the bonner ebert mass. If you've never heard about these two, you will have uh, a definition and a derivation at the end of my, uh, my slides in the PDF. So basically that tells you that the cloud in principle should collapse in, in one chunk in monotonic, monotonically, uh, unless they get some support. And this support is the turbulence. So 
something that probably you have seen in, in school or in the uni is the quantification of turbulence come from the Reynolds number, which is the ratio between the velocity of the flow, the scale length of the flow divided by the kinematic velocity. So the way I like to see it is the force that makes things move divided by the force that resist motion. And when this ratio is high, then you get a turbulent flow. When this ratio is low, you get a liminar, laminar flow, something well organized. So um, something that I, I think illustrates this well is if you go to your kitchen sink or your, your tap, you open the, the tap of water. So the scale length, L is the diameter of your pipe. The kinematic viscosity is that of water. So you only have control on the velocity. So if you start by opening the tap just a little bit, you will see a nice laminar flow. Uh, you can see through the, the, the water, basically. You see the, the other side. It's, it's not fully transparent, but, but you can see through. Now, if you open the tap a bit more, you will, it will start to become uh, white, and you cannot see through anymore. And the reason for that is you increase the velocity, your flow became turbulent, and you, you drive whirlpools or little eddies in the flow of water. And at the interface between the water and the hair around, the, around the, the flow, then this whirlpool will capture little bubbles of hair. And uh, these bubbles will be, you know, uh, become part of the flow. So you notice that if you want to fill a, a bubble or a container with this type of water, you will see it will fill up with bubbles and will overflow, although it's not full yet, if you see what I mean. You have a ton of bubbles there. And, and because you have bubbles, you go from uh, hair bubble, water, bubble, water, etc. So you change the refraction index all the time. And that's why it's appearing white. You cannot see through this, uh, this flow. So that's really what you're seeing is really a transition between laminar flow with low velocity and a turbulent flow with higher velocity. And you see the same here on the, on the picture on the right with the candle smoke. So uh, you see the transition between well-organized flow and something a bit more complex uh, and turbulent. So now if we apply that to the cold interstellar medium, contrary to the water, it's highly compressible and it's supersonic. So we get Reynolds number of the order of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7. If we go to intergalactic medium, that's even worse. It could be up to 10 to the 10. Uh, but it's really uncertain because we don't fully understand the magnetic viscosity that had an extra term in that. I will not talk about that today. But uh, when we want to compare this type of flows in reality in your galaxies to what we actually uh, put in simulation, it's quite hard. The rule of thumb from estimating your Reynolds number in simulation is twice the scale length of your flow divided by resolution. And for typical simulation, typical galaxy simulation, you will get something like 100 to 10,000, which is much smaller than the reality. So that means that in your simulation, you are not really capturing the, the same physical nature of your flow. You're not as turbulent as you should be, in a sense. So these matter a lot uh, because turbulence is responsible for a lot of things in your interstellar medium. So the definition of turbulence is not easy to, to come up with, but basically you can see, and this one is from uh, the fantastic review by Annabelle and Falgaran 2012, turbulence is instability of laminar flows that develops as soon as the initial forces greatly exceed the viscous forces. So as soon as basically the, the motion um, um, exceeds what resists the motion. So you can drive all these complex uh, uh, whirlpools, ADs, et cetera, and what you see in this emission on the right here. So then what happens is the turbulence energy is transferred to smaller and smaller scales until it dissipates. And the dissipation of turbulence is basically the conversion of this kinetic energy into heat due to the particle velocity, viscosity, so viscosity at very, very small scales. In galaxies, we think that the injection scale of turbulence is a few kiloparsec, maybe up to 10 kiloparsec, and this expression scale is probably the milliparsec, so something like 1,000 astronomical units. The scales in between injection and dissipation is called the initial range of turbulence. So the, the textbook example for that is the Kolmogorov cascade. It's one particular example of turbulence. When you have a self-similarity in the velocity field in incompressive turbulence, and you can, you can have an energy spectrum that depends on scale with a power of uh, five thirds, so wave number 
minus five. So, so you see it getting less and less energy uh, with decreasing scale. This is only textbook and not directly applicable to Galaxy because it's incompressible, but uh, the SM is highly uh, compressible. So what you, what you see from that is, and, and including from the movie here, is that turbulence is really key in setting the density structure of the interstellar medium over a wide range of scale, from maybe 10 kiloparsec to subparsec, milliparsec scale. This is not the end of it. It's not. Uh, it's already quite complicated, but it gets even more complicated because this complex density and velocity structure and this fluctuation can come from two modes. So observationally, what you would do is to measure the velocity dispersion through, for example, the line broadening. So here you get the delta nu, so the, the frequency of your line is the frequency itself times these two factors. This one is thermal, so Boltzmann constant times the temperature. And this one is turbulent with the velocity of your, of your flow. Uh, so if the turbulence act as a non-thermal pressure term, then it will act against collapse. Basically, you're mixing your gas, as you can see in this, uh, in this simulation. But it can also increase the density of fluctuations locally, as you can see on this other example on the right here. And then you help collapse. You participate in increasing the density instead of smoothing out over and under densities. So uh, these two modes are called solenoidal, so mixing and compressive mode. And what happened is that they are found all the time in, in interstellar medium of galaxies. But sometimes the relative importance between the two modes changes. And this is, for example, something that uh, we have showed with microelectors. It changes during mergers. And maybe that's why you get the starburst activity. So much more efficient formation of stars in mergers because you get more compression than mixing effect. So this is still quite uh, uh, debated. This is really a modern topic of, uh, of uh, investigation for galaxy physics. From this turbulence, all this mixing, all this compression effect will, uh, will work together with gravitation, with shocks, with all these processes into building the property distribution function of densities of your gas. So this is what is plotted here from, from observation. So this one is column density for a cloud, uh, but uh, we get very similar uh, results in, in galactic scale. So in a galaxy, the PDF, so probability distribution function, has a log normal shape as hinted by this fit here uh, with a black line, which is set by turbulence. So for example, the width of this log normal is a property of the, is linked to the Mach number. And on top of that, you get this polar load tail shown here with the red line, which is set by self-gravity. And so the, the, the global distribution of uh, gas densities is a combination of the two. It seems to be rather universal in galaxies, except if you go to extreme cases, if you go to extreme galaxies like at high redshift or in galaxy interaction. So here in this plot at the bottom, you see the PDF of three different uh, type of galaxies simulated, Milky Way, large magic clouds, small magic clouds, so different masses. And you see they have similar shapes, small differences in details, but similar shapes. You don't see the polar tail and this is a resolution effect because the polar really appears at, uh, I would say, parsec or even subparsec uh, scales. And in galaxy simulation, it's quite expensive to reach this resolution. But we have done that with a higher resolution simulation, and we do see the polar appearing there. So, of course, this is very important to understand what kind of density or, or in what density, uh, what state of density your gas is because this becomes the ingredient for star formation. And if you get a lot of dense gas, you will form a lot of stars. If you get a lot of denser gas, you will form stars maybe in a different, uh, with a different rate or different efficiency. So that describes the ingredient, but doesn't tell you where they are or how they're organized in space. And to, to look at that, you can plot the, or you can look at the poor spectrum density, PSD, that gives you basically the relative representativity of the scale. So here I put the definition. You have a, a signal, so it's uh, it's come from signal processing. So basically, you have here you, your density, your map of density in your galaxy, and uh, you can recognize this is actually a Fourier transform. If you have a resolution delta x and, and you sample this density map with n pixels or n cells, um, don't 
care to you don't care too much about the, the exact details. What you need to understand is that the it's basically the Fourier transform time its complex conjugates, so the norm squared. And what it means is that you have a, a way to represent if a scale typical scale appears uh, often in your in your galaxy or not. So this is what it looks like from a from a simulation I made a few months ago. You have here the large scale. So traditionally, you put the large scales on the left and small scales on the right. This comes from uh, historical reason because we 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 started to do uh, wave numbers uh, uh, on this axis on the, the inverse of the scale. So here we have a little gray, uh, shady gray area, which is uh, too close to resolution limit. So you should not trust anything there. But what we have basically here and in almost all simulation of galaxies is you see a kind of change in the slope of this uh, power spectrum around 100 parsec there. We don't really care about the exact values. What we care about is slope in this type of exercise. And the change of slope is actually coming from resolving the internal physics of disk. If you have at larger scale, the disk is infinitely this thin. So your turbulence is only 2D. But if you get into uh, smaller scales, then you can actually resolve the thickness of your disk and you can see the, I would say, vertical motion of turbulence within the disk scale height. And that makes the difference there. So of course, other features can be seen. In principle, they're not so easy to see because, for example, feedback effects or bubble size or things like that, large scale structure like spiral arms or inter-arm medium. But it's, in practice, kind of difficult because they are arrayed out uh, over the entire galaxy. So you don't really see a big spike. It's really difficult to see a big uh, signature like that. And now if we want to compare to what we see in real galaxies, so these are uh, uh, three galaxies from the thing sample, and uh, you see their power spectrum in black in this plot. And the color uh, lines show you simulation of similar galactic mass, similar disk galaxies, with feedback in red and with no feedback in blue here. And you really see a big difference in slope and in, um, in general behavior uh, between the two. So you clearly see that to get the scale distribution, so basically the organization of the interstellar medium right, we need to have feedback because without feedback, you get a large discrepancy, specifically at small scales. It makes sense. As feedback comes from the small scales, uh, so you get a larger discrepancy, but it still affects basically uh, kiloparsec, several kiloparsec scales up there. So to get statistically correct these galaxies, you need uh, feedback to get your properties right. Now let's talk about the injection scale of turbulence. This is still a debated topic, uh, but we know we need to inject turbulence because it dissipates. If you don't inject it, it will disappear at some point. So you need to maintain uh, energy injection of turbulence. The way to compute the, the injection scale is this formula. If you look closely, it's just the average of wave number or inverse wave numbers weighted by the energy at this uh, scale. Uh, what it means is that you can see what is the most energetic scales somehow. So here you see again from different simulations, uh, different type of galaxies, the measure of this injection scale with feedback at the subject lines and without feedback as a dotted line. And the exercise, uh, the, the evolution in time. So you see it's quite stabilized after the start of the simulation. And you, again, you have a very high difference uh, between the two. You have a, a factor of a few uh, between the two cases. So with feedback, what we know gets the correct density distribution, we get the correct power spectrum, we get injection scale of one kiloparsec in these examples. So what this tells you is that the feedback that come from stars, so really milliparsec scales, it participates to the turbulence injection to scales much, much, much larger than that, even larger than molecular clouds up to kiloparsecs. So that tells you that the coupling of feedback with a large dynamical uh, disk galaxy scales is really important. So what you will see tomorrow is, if, is that the distribution of energy and momentum by stellar feedback is rather well understood. We have anti cool solutions for the expansion of supernovae bubbles, for example. What is much, much more difficult to, to understand and to describe is how this feedback effect couples to larger scales, in particular to galactic scales. 
So let me illustrate that with an example. Let's consider a box of gas. So I pick 100 parsec by 100 by 100 parsec. Velocity dispersion of 10 km per second, density of 100 atom per cubic centimeter. I make this box of gas and I make different realization of the same turbulence. So this is what you see here. You have four different examples. These average values are the same, 100 per sec, 10 km per second, 100 atom per cubic centimeters. But only the statistical realization, the rendering, the rendering of turbulence is different. So that means that if you do a cosmological simulation, for example, and you don't resolve 100 parsec resolution, these four cases are exactly strictly identical for you. Now, what we have done uh, with a student Loke Olin a few years ago here is to put one supernova at the very center of this box and let it explode. And this is what we get. So you see the expansion of the supernova bubble. You see the cavity being carved out of the gas density. But because the surrounding density is very diverse, very complex, the shape of the bubble varies a lot. Even if statistically speaking, these cases are the same uh, at, the, at 100 parsec scale. So we try to quantify that to see if we can simplify this complexity or if we can describe this complexity in a way. So what you see here on the x-axis, you get the time. On the y-axis, you get the size of a bubble, so the cubic root of the volume, whatever. What you see here with the dotted line is uh, the solution for uh, in, a, in a homogeneous medium. So if you had homogeneous uh, density of 100 atom per cubic centimeter, 10, 5, and 1. So in the example I've just showed you, you expect everything to be at 100 atom per cubic centimeters. But we did many of these experiments. And what we found is that it's a huge mess. It's a huge scatter and not even around 100 atom per cubic centimeters, but most of them has, have a, a larger size, so lower density on average. So it's far from uh, the analytical solution. Here it comes the average and the standard deviation. So you see it's, it, it would correspond to uh, something between five and one atom per cubic centimeters, while again, what we put in the simulation is 100 atom per cubic centimeter on average. So that tells you that the coupling from the large scales, the coupling of feedback to the large scales really depend on the fine details of the interstellar medium structure. If you are facing walls of high densities or if you already have cavities, that's really different, that's highly anisotropic. And that's impossible to resolve in cosmological simulations because you need, in principle, you need the resolution of, uh, of a stellar radius. So that's extremely expensive. So now you can question from this result, you can question the validity of feedback in these large scale simulations. Is it correct? Is it correct on average or is it all wrong? And, and we, it's still a, a open question. The other aspect that is very important is that where you inject the feedback as we have seen matters a lot, but it's not so simple because the stars move and before they actually explode at supernovae, for example, they can move significantly away from the formation sites. So uh, I will illustrate that with two aspects. The first one is asymmetric drift. We know that the velocity of a star in the galaxy is uh, so velocity squared, the combination of the circular velocity and fluctuation around these circular velocities, around the guiding center, as you like. Uh, so if we start at the time of formation, the stars, the velocity of the stars inherit that of the cloud. So basically it's your turbulent velocity, something that 10 km per second. But then if you wait a few million years, the stars and the gas do not follow the same rules, the same laws of physics. So because of relaxation, because of interaction between stars, the velocity of the, of the stars will increase to something like 15 km per second, while the gas will dissipate this energy, at least part of this energy, and go down to nine kilometers per second. So now if you put these values back into your formula for the velocity of your galaxy, you end up with the conclusion that the stars will move slowly, slower around the galaxy. So they will lag behind the cloud. So you see that quite well in this simulation I made a few years ago of a Milky Way like galaxy. So you have an arrow here on the top right pointing toward the galactic center and the motion of the disk is this long arrow like that. You see a few clouds that I highlight with this density contrast here. And these clouds are star forming and you see they have a kind of conic shape, a conic structure behind them. 
like that here, here, and behind all of them and always in the same direction. And this is this drift. The supernova project are, are moved, are, are getting uh, slower than the clouds, so they, they lag behind. And when the supernova goes up, they carve this kind of conic shape uh, propeller thing. The only aspect that makes stars move before they go supernova, before they inject feedback in general, is the process of rendering stars. Uh, the stars can get kicked out from clusters, from star clusters, because of star star interaction. You get the gravitational sling, slingshot, for example. And this could be quite fast. You can reach res, uh, velocities of several uh, 100 kilometers per second. So this means that not only your stars leave the cloud, but can also reach low density interstellar medium and even the circumgalactic medium. So here you see a simulation of Milky Way light galaxy or mass of a galaxy uh, with the uh, rendering stars on the right and without rendering stars on the left. And you really see the difference in uh, the, the damage that the feedback can make in carving more bubbles, larger bubbles, because the stars move in between the dense part, between the spiral arms, and can uh, be much more efficient at creating big cavity. So it's, it propagates larger, it couples to larger scales, but it also affects less gas because the gas is less dense. So um, that could lead to less efficient or less rapid destruction of your cloud because you, you basically reduce the amount of feedback energy you put in your cloud. All these become the large scale disk dynamics. Now, uh, it, it has been clear from cosmological simulation that feedback is needed to regulate galactic formation at the whole to get the correct galactic mass, even to get the correct galactic component. Uh, and we have efficient suppression of star formation by star feedback in the first billion years of evolution of, uh, of a galaxy. So here in this plot, you see the redshift on the right. So the time goes from right to left and you get the star formation, right, star formation rate on the y-axis. Without feedback, you will jump there and you maintain a kind of a steady state of star formation. But with the regulation of feedback, you will get much, much lower values like that. It's a, it's a log scale on the y-axis. So this regulation is not very simple to, to describe. That's why we are doing simulations to, to, to get it correct, or to, to describe it uh, as a whole, because uh, it depends on how much feedback is injected in terms of energy, in terms of momentum. You have the self-regulation of star formation by feedback that makes the process quite complicated. And it also depends on how the galaxy reacts to this feedback. So basically what the escape velocity of the galaxy. And this is again, a quite complicated uh, aspect. So all this makes the process non-linear, highly non-linear, I would say, and also time dependent. It's absolutely not the same thing before the formation of the disk, during the formation of the disk, during the formation of spirals and bars, and once your galaxy is more quiet, I would say. But yet, Feedback is not uh, magic. It does not explain everything. It's not the solution to all your problems. And you see that uh, with this, uh, uh, these plots by, by Timmy, who I think is in the audience. So uh, sorry if I, if I steal your results, Timmy. I will uh, uh, illustrate that. So on the x-axis, you have the star formation rate. On the y-axis, you get the velocity dispersion. And so these are quite uh, busy plots. But basically, the symbols, the colored symbols are different measurements from real galaxy or regions of galaxies. And the background histograms are uh, measurement from simulations. So only the background changes for, in between the two panels. And you see actually the change is not so big between no feedback on the left and feedback on the right. Uh, you get the similar shape, you get the similar behavior, the same turning point here uh, with high star formation rate. So that tells you that uh, the observed velocity dispersion is not only caused by feedback, uh, but also from large scale disk dynamics or so gravitational related uh, aspects that are very important to take into account. And this is still a very hot topic, which is highly debated. So what seems to be the consensus toward which we are getting is that feedback is an important you know, a very, very crucial ingredient, but it doesn't do everything. You need it to, to feed the other processes to steer the, the galactic structure. So this is, again, a simulation of Milky Way light galaxy. You see it face on on the left, edge on on the right. You see feedback is changing also the vertical structure by ejecting some part of the gas. 
And if you don't have feedback, as you can see here, you get a completely different structure. You get unstable region, basically nothing stops the collapse of your clouds before you get into a thermal pressure support. So you get very small clumps. But if you have feedback, you can regulate this and you eject or you, you mix part of the gas you put it in between the clouds or outside of the clouds, and you make it available for large scale dynamics, gravity aspects to change the shape and to make which looks like much better uh, uh, this galaxy. And this is true for the face on views and also for the edge on at the bottom. So talking about the structure of the galaxy, uh, I will spend some time uh, talking about the, the role of uh, different structures. So let's start with the most important are the most, uh, let's say, visual ones like spiral galaxies, spiral arms in galaxies. The role of spirals is to organize and to regulate the interstellar medium, but it's not completely clear yet how uh, it works. So here it's an observation of molecular clouds in the Milky Way. The sun is up there at the top, and you see clearly the distribution of clouds follows the spiral structure. It's even more striking if you look at uh, an external galaxy or a galaxy from, from outside, like here again, in 83, you see very clear spiral structure and you see all these young star forming region that uh, shine in, in blue, so young stars are in red, like uh, infrared emission along the spiral arms. So clearly uh, it shows the role of spiral arms, but as we will see in a second, there are density waves and not material waves and they develop when they are trapped in between resonance in the disks. So let's have a look at that in more detail. The basic idea for spiral formation is coming from differential rotation. So imagine that you have a disk like that, that rotates and you look at a packet of gas, which is this solid circle there. If you look uh, after some time, you see that because of differential rotation, this packet will be sheared away like this. And then on the, on the bottom panels, you see a longer time evolution. So that's how you can form a spiral with just differential rotation, easy, simple, quite natural, and we see that also in the cappuccino cup. So the thing is that if you, have a, if you get a flat rotation curve as observed in galaxies, you know that's one of the justification for the presence of dark matter. Then you get a, a differential rotation in these forms of angular frequency depending on the inverse of the radius. So that's how you get the matter sheared into a spiral shape, just as illustrated here. But the problem is that quickly the spiral will be tightly wounded. So very getting more and more uh, elongated, getting almost close to circles. And therefore it will be short lived. It's not, it will dislocate if you want. It will be short lived because of that it will be torn apart. And it's not like we see, for example, in grand design spirals when you have two huge spiral arms which are nicely uh, pointing toward the opposite direction. It's not at all like that. And this has been referred to the winding problem when trying uh, a few decades ago to explain the formation of spiral arms. So here is a, a movie of that. You see how it's, uh, how it's made. So you start with spirals and very quickly, it's actually become difficult to see the spiral structure. It looks like concentric rings. It's still a spiral, but it looks like uh, concentric circles in this uh, thing because of the winding problem. So simple solution to this problem you will reform the spirals. You get it dissolved or dislocated because of that, so you have to form it again. It doesn't work quite well because spiral arms are also seen in near infrared, which means that they contain old stars. So they must be rather old. Solution then is that spiral arms are not material structure, they're not dragging the gas around, but they are density waves. And that's the basic of the density wave theory by Lin and Shu from the 60s. So here you see in this movie, in the rotation frame of the spirals, you see how it works. You see the gas coming in in the spiral going through and leaving. And you see in this uh, artist impression that it's in the spirals, you can compress your gas and form stars and make these little red knots. So the spiral structure has a pattern speed. Let's call it omega p. Almost all the stars in your galaxy will have a different one, except at a very specific radius, which is called the co-rotation. But I will not talk about that. The thing is that you need an external, or you need some process to get your pattern speed. You need an instability to trigger it. 
One example of that would be tidal interaction. If you have a companion passing by, it will induce a pattern speed like that, but it's not true in all cases. So it's still not fully understood what triggered the formation of spiral arms. Once the spiral arms are in place for whatever reason, then the passage of the wave will increase the local density of everything, including of gas, and therefore you will favor star formation. This is what you see with this little cartoon here, be, just because you get uh, higher than uh, um, a line pattern like that, you get uh, higher densities. So the cloud are expected to be destroyed when they go through the harm and leave the harm, uh, because. But the problem is that we observe inter-arm clouds. You observe clouds in between the, the arms. This is again not fully understood. Why do they survive? How can they survive? And of course, it relates to the uncertainties of the lifetime of a cloud I talked about later. Uh, sorry, earlier. Uh, they could be much longer lived because they're more resistant to dynamical effects, for example. So the cloud formation is, of course, more efficient along the spiral arms. Here you see an example from a simulation by Claire Dobbs. Uh, here the, the simulation is, is with a fixed pattern fit, so you impose the, pattern, the spiral structure, that's why it's so nice and stable. And you see how the clouds, you really see the spiral because it's, it's made of clouds there. And if you look closely, you also see the clouds being distorted, torn apart, sheared apart when they leave the spiral arm. Um, so the reason for that is because you get a shallower potential, so you don't get the compression from the spirals, and you get a stronger shear in between the spiral arm. The thing is that arms themselves, they have a little effect on the process of star formation itself. So what I mean by that is that if it's easier to get molecular clouds in spiral arms, but once you get a molecular cloud, it doesn't really matter if you're in spiral arm or not. And you see that with this observation in three different galaxies, you see the distribution of star formation intensity efficiency sorry, in molecular gas. And what we care about is the solid line and the dotted line, uh, the, sorry, the dashed lines. So di different uh, distribution of star formation uh, efficiency in the arms in solid and in the inter arms in dashed line. And you see, you don't really see big differences between the two cases. So basically, once your cloud is there, star formation will proceed the same way. Uh, the only difference is, do you get the same clouds or do you get clouds as efficiently in the spiral arms or not? And all clouds are not the same. You also get a diversity of examples. This is illustrated here by the M51 galaxy, so the Whirlpool galaxy. If you know it, you know that there is a satellite galaxy uh, up there in the top left. And on the right, you see the CO map of that from the post survey by uh, Eva Schiller and collaborator. And you see the, the different shapes of the CO emission. For example, here you get a little spur out of the arms, and here you get more elongated structure. We do understand that, and we also reproduce it in our simulations. Uh, so let's take this simulation. It's a Milky Way-like galaxy I made a few years ago. And let's focus on two pieces of a spiral arm, so one here and one there. This is what they look like in more detail. So you really see, so in this one, for example, in the bottom right, you see uh, almost equally spaced clouds, which are called beads on the string. And on the other one, you see uh, these spurs, so things that goes um, away from the main axis of the of the spiral, and the explanation for this difference has to be has to come from the pitch angle of the arm. So basically, the inclination of the arm with respect to the radial direction. If you are very radial, like here in the bead of the string, because of differential uh, velocity in your disk, so what I, what I show here with the arrows, you don't get a huge velocity difference between the inner part of your spirals and the outer part, as I can show here. However, if you have a, if you have a, a very almost circular spiral arms and not radial at all, then because of the differential rotation, you get a very, very high velocity difference between the inner part and the outer part. And this is how you get a lot of shear, and this is how you drive Kelvin and mode sensibilities, so differential velocity between two sides of something. And that's what makes these little spurs like that. Basically, you take your gas and you put it at the end of these things, but not in the bulk of the spiral arm anymore. Uh, and therefore, you can have this, if you continue to do that, if you let this cloud evolve, it could actually leave the arm and uh, survive the lack of compression, the lack of gravitational binding from the arms. So again, this question, the universality of the lifetime of the clouds, 
which is thought to be 10 million years, but it could be actually longer in this type of um, structure. So it's still highly debated. And it's not so easy to address in simulation because it depends on a lot of the prescription for feedback. Uh, this is illustrated by these two movies. You have here a cloud with the same mass, one with shear, one with compression, so different boundary conditions almost. The blue dots show stars. Uh, we don't have feedback in this simulation, so we'll not see the ejection. But you see really first a different organization of the interstellar medium, and second, a different process of star formation. Again, with the caveat that there is no feedback. But you can see that even early in the, in the evolution of these structures, you have different, uh, different outcome, basically. You get different time scales, you get different star formation rate, uh, density, you get different star cluster formation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really, that's really important in the final outcome of your cloud uh, evolution. It's also true uh, in, at larger scales, we have a diversity of shear environments. So because of the galactic uh, velocity curve, you get a steep uh, curve in the, in the bar. So you get a strong shear, a strong difference between two nearby radii, if you want. So this is illustrated here with this map. You recognize the same Milky Way-like galaxy here. You get the bar at the center, you get spiral arms. And the color shows you the uh, relative intensity between the shear and cell gravity. I don't put numbers here because that's um, very difficult to interpret. But basically, in the blue regions, you have very weak shear. So it's mostly well binding together. And in red regions, you see mostly inside the bar here, you get a strong shear when uh, structures like clouds could be uh, destroyed very, very efficiently. So what happened is that the shear will smooth out every over densities like the clouds in the central uh, zone. That doesn't mean that you reduce the gas density. That just means that you don't you have something more homogeneous at these things. So you don't have over density seeds for the clouds to collapse on, and therefore you slow down the process of star formation because there is not something to, you know, focus your matter on. And that could be an explanation of why the central molecular zone is very inefficient at forming stars despite high level of molecular gas. So uh, in uh, a few minutes I have left, I will talk about bar also, very important uh, aspects of uh, how large scale disk dynamics regulate the interstellar medium and star formation. So without going into the detail of all the resonances, et cetera, if you don't know about that, go at the end of the slides and you will see uh, explanation and, and derivations. But basically, if we take our angular frequency and we, we subtract half of the epicyclic frequencies, that tells you when you have a resonance, a natural resonance there. And uh, this quantity could be roughly constant over a large range of radii in the inner galaxies. And in that case, the orbit in this, in this radius range will precede Processory together. That's what I illustrate this little cartoon here. You see that if the orbit presses together, you will get elongated structure that will make a bar. And therefore, the shape is preserved in this range of radii, and you can form a bar like that. The thing is that it's never perfectly constant. It's never you know, as simple as in the textbook. So, gravity or self gravity is needed to keep things together, to keep your structure um, bound. Now the question is, how do you make this orbit in the first place? And this is for the same reason as uh, for the spiral, we don't have a complete answer to that. We need something, maybe uh, interacting galaxies are playing an important role there, but it's not clear yet. So uh, in the present day disk galaxies, we have a high central mass concentration, for example, in the bulge. Therefore, you will have a strong inner limb blood resonance, basically a strong region like that in the central part of your galaxy. And, and therefore, you will have very stable regime when you cannot re, uh, uh, let instabilities to, to, to grow. So we will not form a bar. Or it will be much more difficult to form a bar or spiral arm. And that's why, basically, if you go to an anticolor galaxy, like S0 galaxy, you see that bulge dominated. The bulge is very important. And you don't see spiral arms, simply because another way to say that is that the, the gravitational effect of the bulge is stabilizing the disk against this perturbation that could lead to the growth of bar and uh, spiral instabilities. So therefore, you can conclude that the strong bars must form and grow very slowly together with the central mass uh, as the galaxy form. And these things should go together hand in hand to form your, your final disk galaxies. 
The important point also to keep in mind is that because of bars are great, massive, usually they are the strong gravitational effects and they can exert gravitational torques on the matter around the bar in the rest of the galaxy. And these gravitational torques will make the matter lose energy and therefore drive the gas inward. So for example, that's why we say that bars can flow uh, gas toward the galactic center, maybe even fuel an active galactic nucleus, the massive black hole at the, at the center of your galaxy. Now, if we look a bit more at a very interesting region, which is the tip of the bar, what happened there is that in the bar, the gas can, can circulate along the bar. So here you see again this simulation, you see the, the background color is the gas density. So you recognize the bar here, it's connected to a spiral arm at the, in the left and the red arrows represent the velocity field of your gas. So you see the gas circulates along the bar like that, and this thing is called X1 orbit, particular shape of orbit. So that means that the tip of the bar, this region, center of the, the center of this plot here, is the apocenter of your uh, X1 orbit. So what happens at apocenter, like any type of orbit, you slow down. It's just Kepler of laws of motion. You slow down, you can see that from the velocity field, the arrows are much smaller. And if you slow down, then what is behind you catch up with you, and therefore you make a traffic jam. It's exactly the same process. This thing is called orbital crowding. You get more things, in that case, packet of gas at the epicenter of your orbit, so at the tip of the bar in this example. In addition to that, you connect to the spiral arms, so uh, you get even more possibility of fueling matter there, and you get even more crowding. So that's why you see all these tiny black dots here, which are uh, molecular clouds in this region and much, much less elsewhere in the, in the plot. So this means that this tip of the bar is a preferential location for cloud-cloud collisions. When clouds are so nearby, then they can actually collide. What happens in cloud collisions is that you increase the gas density for a simple reason. You put two clouds together, so you put uh, more mass in the, in the same volume, and also because you have shocks in between the, the two clouds. So this is an example in the same simulation. You see clearly the two clouds are not totally merged yet. They just have started to interact and you see a signature of this interaction in, term, in the shape of uh, tidal tails, this um, particular S shape. So it's the same physics as in galaxy mergers. You can detect these uh, this tidal tails and this is actually true in observations so in the real galaxy, in the real Milky Way. This is W43, so at the tip of the bar of Milky Way, and you see again these tidal tails there uh, in this complex, uh, this uh, giant molecular association so the, with different uh, density knots. So then what happened in that case, just like in interacting galaxies, you can trigger star formation in a boosted way, the, I would say almost starburst way. So you, you have so, 15 minutes left. Okay, thank you. So what we are what we are seeing is uh, because of the motion of the bar themselves and because of the orbit of the cloud. So in this case, they're coming from here. So here you see two progenitors, P1 and P2, and they will interact a bit later to downstream from the tip of the bar in this um, dotted area, roughly. So this means that uh, the, the young stars of the process star formation will happen on the downstream side of the tip of the bar. So there is a asymmetry there. And it's also observed in, in old bar galaxies. So you get more star formation after you pass by the tip of the bar. What happened there is you get high star formation efficiency, higher star formation efficiency than in progenitor clouds, and also like higher than in typical clouds or average clouds. So this is what I illustrate with this uh, kinko schmidt diagram. So on the x-axis, you get surface density of gas. On the y-axis, you get surface density of star formation rate. And here, every little dot is one cloud in my simulation. And I look at them at two epochs, early in red, late in black. And I pick up the two projectors. So P1 and P2 are these two big uh, red circles. And they will merge and become the black results here. So you see, why, why the red points are more or less on the average of the clouds, the black is clearly above the average. You see that the entire population has have moved up a bit simply because of uh, evolution of cloud, I would say, but these two, uh, on average, the result of the merger or the result of the collision is much higher in this plot, which means that for a given quantity of gas, 
you form more stars. So you are more efficient at forming stars like this. So it's really comparable to what happened in galaxy mergers. The reason why uh, it's, it doesn't have higher gas surface density is probably because it has ejected a part of its gas in the form of tidal tails, for example. So it's, uh, it's slides in between the two. And uh, we have also seen in simulation and the observation that uh, collisions, because of this shock, because of extreme conditions, can lead to the formation of massive stars. So more stars, but also more massive stars than average. So maybe that's also hinting towards large scale dynamical effect influencing something as small scale as the initial mass function. So I will end up talking uh, very, very briefly about what happened at higher redshift, and in particular in clumpy galaxies. So let's go to redshift one, two, maybe three. Uh, at higher redshift, we have a high gas fraction in galaxies. So the gas fraction is the ratio between the mass of gas divided by the mass of baryons, so stars plus gas. And for Milky Way like galaxy, we expect it to be 50 to 60% at redshift one or two. So the Milky Way was much, much more uh, gas rich at this redshift than present day. Present day is something like 10%. We also have a higher turbulence in the interstellar medium with Mach number as high as 10, while it's around one for present day Milky Way. And we have instabilities which are driven by the gas in the interclub medium that leads to a formation of massive gas clumps, much, much bigger than giant molecular clouds, something like 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine for the biggest one. And you see it leads to very, very different morphologies. Here you see these galaxies with these clumps uh, that dominate the UV light. You see really the complex structure there. It's, uh, it's so much important that it makes us question, is it only one galaxy or are we looking at interacting galaxies together? And you need other diagnostics to actually say that this is actually one galaxy with several clumps in that. And in these clumps, because they are so dense, you get intense star formation. So high star formation rate, but uh, recent simulations show that the star formation efficiency is not so different. So again, you form a lot of stars, but more or less in the same process because you are in a nice, well-behaved disk, if I, if I say. So, so here's a, a simulation of that, where you can see the gas density. And uh, I pick the color scales to, to make the, the cloud saturate in dark red. You just really see uh, it's dominated by a few massive, massive clumps uh, like that, that tend to spiral in and merge toward the center, but it takes some time. Because you have some high density in this cloud, the feedback from the stars can be actually trapped. Remember that the propagation of feedback, the coupling to the larger scales, really depends on the kind of density that you have. So if your feedback is trapped, uh, maybe it's not so efficient to destroying your cloud. So maybe your cloud can survive for more than 100 million years, uh, survive long enough to spiral in, to go in toward the galactic center, and maybe to participate in the formation of the bulge of your galaxy maybe participate in the growth of your black hole, maybe trigger AGN activity. This is very uh, timely topic, still highly debated, but uh, we think it's likely that this is true because um, it, it all depends on the prescription you have uh, for feedback, basically star formation and feedback. But by matching uh, different observables in the local universe, we think that these aspects of feedback are okay and therefore we can rely on what we get uh, at higher redshift. I would be uh, still cautious uh, about uh, getting a firm and definitive conclusions on that. So this is, uh, uh, to, con to conclude almost, is uh, what you get if you vary the gas fraction in your galaxy. So I started with the exact same uh, initial conditions. I just put a different fraction between stars and, and gas in my disk. And you see that very, very quickly, my simulation gives me different structures. So with low gas fractions, so on the left you have 10% of gas and the rest in stars. You really see elongated spiral structures with knots, which are the molecular clouds, very, very quickly within one rotation period. And if you increase the gas fraction already at 25% or 40%, you get something different. It's more and more difficult to see the spiral structure and you see these massive clumps in, in the gas. So that really impacts how you you structure your intestinal medium and how star formation proceeds. So these are our maps, maybe making it easier to see it. So uh, each column is a different uh, gas fraction. 
and each line is different components. You have the atomic gas at the top, molecular in the middle, and stellar components at the bottom. And you really see that something is happening in your disk galaxy between 25 and 10 percent. Uh, at low gas friction, you get a structure of spiral arms, giant molecular clouds. If you look at the stars, it looks like an with a normal and usual galaxy like, like we know and love. You see some knots which are young clusters along the spiral arms. If we go to higher gas fraction, you don't see this so much. You still have some elongated structure, but not really spiral arms. And you get this, you, you still have these low mass clumps, but also a lot of massive ones uh, in between. So that's really a different structure in that, that you uh, achieve just by changing the gas fraction. There is still a lot of things to understand about all that. It has to, to do with um, what drives instabilities in galactic disk between the stars and the gas and how this evolved with redshift. So you see it's, it, there is a, a lot of aspect to, to investigate in this, uh, in this matter. So I'm gonna stop here and, and take questions. I will just mention that um, at the end of the, of the PDF, you get supplementary materials with uh, mathematical definition and derivation of some of the quantities maybe you're not uh, not all of you are familiar with so feel free to go there and to to explore what I've been talking about so thank you thank you the questions now yeah yeah so you have a lot of questions in the slack yeah. uh, so you may want are, are we not going to uh, ask for them all of them but you can uh, answer later so i try to group them by category so you have a category on the spiral arms you you have answered to some of them i guess uh, so are there any successful attempt to simulate long lived spiral arms to date uh, depends what you call long-lived, <laughs> but um, I, I would say yes. In cosmological simulation, not so much, for reasons that we don't really understand. Uh, you you see that basically it's quite difficult in in high-resolution simulation. It's difficult to get uh, long-lived bars and or even bar formation or spiral formation in uh, cosmological simulation, and we don't really understand why. It's relatively not easy, but common to see them at low resolution. So there is something there that we don't really understand. Okay. If you if you use the isolated setup, so a galaxy without the cosmological context, then you can really control much better what you put in and, and the velocity dispersions, for example, the velocity profiles in your galaxy and the regime of instabilities you want to be. So in that case, if you want long list power arms, then you can make them, but it's really artificial, I would say. Okay. So do you think we see more young stars in spiral arms because the spiral arms themselves have a direct impact on star formation? Or do we just see more star forming in spiral arms because there is more material in the arms than in the inter-arm regions? Both. <laughs> uh, I, th I think that the picture I'm showing here is, is illustrating that quite well. You have young stars in between the spiral arms. And you get also, uh, of course, young stars in the spiral arms, but you also get more massive star forming region in the spiral arms. For example, if you can see my cursor, can, can you see the cursor, by the way? Yeah. Should have asked that yeah, two yeah, hours yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so here, for example, you get a very massive star forming region in the spiral arm. So it's not just more star forming region, it's also bigger star forming region because you get more favorable physical conditions for your gas to form stars. So I would say that the way I see it is um, in between the spiral arms, it's rather difficult to form stars, but it's not impossible. In the spiral arm, it's, it's much easier. So you, not only you get more of it, but also in a more efficient way, I say. Nice. So what about Lindblad resonances as triggers of sp spiral arm formation? Uh, sorry, say again? Uh, as triggers of spiral arm formation. So uh, I don't really think that uh, limbal resonance can trigger the formation of something, but they can maintain it. Uh, basically, what you, so again, if I take this example, uh, you see that there is probably a resonance here at this radius when the spiral arm starts. And there is probably here at least, uh, you know, at the edge of this picture when the spiral arms end. So this particular example is a bit more difficult because you get the companion galaxies nearby, but, um, so maybe it has some tidal effect on that. But uh, the, the Lindblad resonance is just 
I would say a, a, a barrier in your in your dynamics to allow the the spirals or even the bar to develop, or you know even structure in the bars if you go to uh, ten bar six scales typically. Okay, so I'm going to the second set of questions. Uh, so, what is the physical origin for the low density tail of gas PDF? Low density tail of gas PDF. Let me go there so that I know what I'm talking about. This one, I suppose. I guess so this tail here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's. Uh, I would say. It, um, so if we if we go to I'm I'm not so familiar with column density <laughs> numbers, but if you go to to volume density number three diffuse gas, so ten to the minus five, ten to the minus three. So it's it's um, circumgalactic medium basically. So you're not in the disk regime when turbulence is uh, setting things. Mm. It's, it's setting the the structure. So you're really looking at uh, infalling gas, outflowing gas mixing together. So it's it's much more complicated. Uh, in the in the picture at the top, it's much more of scale. So this is in the Taurus or Polaris uh, cloud from um, from uh, Philippe André, and it's uh, it's a good question. It should not be so low density there. So maybe it's um, above the disk plane a bit. You could get there. Huh. I'm not sure. Okay. So why star lag behind the gas in a galaxy? Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, asymmetric drift thing. So the idea uh, there is that basically you start with a, a given energy to, to, to move in your galaxy. So part of this energy is to move around the galaxy so that the circular velocity term and the rest of this energy is to move, um, you know, to do other motion, which is the sigma uh, term. And because the stars and the gas evolve a different way, the gas can dissipate the energy. So you, you convert um, kinetic energy into heat and you radiate the heat away, for example. And the stars cannot do that. The stars, it's not a dissipative medium or a dissipative component. So what the stars can do is to interact together and get gravitational slingshots, for example. So that's why the sigma term for the stars increases and the sigma term for the gas tend to decrease. And now if you combine that with the so if you keep V square constant, so your total energy, this means that your circular velocity has to adjust. And because of that, the stars will typically take longer to go around the galaxy than the, than the gas. And that just means that even within a few million years, they will lag behind. Okay. Uh, next question. So do we quantitatively understand the efficiency with which different feedback processes inject energy into VISM? No. <laughs> yeah, but certainly. Um, <laughs> yeah. When there is feedback in the question, the answer is no. <laughs> um, okay. Well, it, it, there is a lot of different ways to unfold this question. Uh, we do understand, I think, rather well the process of injection of feedback in the sense that it's coming from, uh, uh, you know, galaxy evolution, uh, sorry, stellar evolution models, which are well precise enough in terms of uh, injection of feedback. The problem is that how the different components of feedback combined together, like I even talk about that. I think, I think it's a lecture for tomorrow uh, by Eve. She will, she will probably tell you about all the different feedback ingredients like winds, uh, cosmic rays, um, all these pre-supernova effect that basically make the life of supernova easier or the effect of supernova easier in making big damage to your cloud or to your galaxy. And this really depends so much on the density structure of your cloud, also on the temperature structure of your clouds. You can have very, very large differences from one cloud to the next, or from one region of the galaxy to the next, because you get the different turbulence, because you get different um, density spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. So all this is highly nonlinear. There is a bit of self-regulation, because if you get denser gas, you get more stars and therefore you get more feedback. So feedback, uh, you get more feedback to fight against higher densities, but it's not linear problem. And that's why we don't really understand that in details, or at least we don't have simple analytical or semi-analytical mm. model. To this yeah, yeah. Okay, so next question. While using a model for subgrid densities, 
how much does a gravity tail affect the results? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is that about the density PDF? I guess so, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, so the first part is about subgrid recipe for what? Can you can you read it? No, while using a model for subgrid density on scale resolved in your simulation, how much does a gravity tail affect the results? Uh, okay, I guess it's about not capturing the gravity tail here. Um, yeah. So it's not really using a, a subgrid model for this. It's um, the, the density that you can capture depend on scale, right? Because you get a, a, an amount of mass in your cell, simulation cell, or in your particle. And if you go to smaller scale, then you can get a low density with one density peak. So it's really dependent on the scale that you, you are getting there. So this truncation almost, this artificial truncation of your galaxy PDF depends on the scale. So it depends on the resolution you are at. It's not something we can choose. So if you have the density tails are not depending on the resolution, it will, uh, it will affect your results if you don't change anything else. But the game is that if you don't get the same resolution, then you have to adjust your recipe for feedback, star formation, etc. So if I have a resolution that allows me to get at least part of this high density tail, then I will not use the same physical prescription, at least not the same values for my recipe for star formation than if I have something like that. I need to adjust it because I'm not capturing the same physics. And it's, uh, it's not trivial. It's absolutely not uh, easy to do. And that's why we have to always go back to the observation to calibrate the recipes at a given resolution in a given um, set of physical conditions. OK. So next, do we see weak star formation in the central molecular zone in over galaxies? How this compare with nuclear star formation in AGN? Uh, in other galaxies, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, so it's it's a few hundred parsec in uh, in the Milky Way. In other so in nearby galaxy, you should be able to resolve that. I don't know if we see this. And how does it relate to a nuclear star cluster on AGN? Um, uh, that's a very interesting question and quite complex. So I think in terms of nuclear star cluster it's created in a, in a difficult way because you get a lot of gas, but it's not star forming. So that means that basically you're fueling your cluster with gas, but not with stars. So that probably changed the dynamics of the star cluster. And, and if you're, for some reason, you still have star formation in your cluster, then it affects the way feedback propagates again. And for the same reason, it affects the um, AGN in the sense that you get a lot of dense gas to fuel your, your AGN activity, uh, but in a very, very, Okay, a smooth way. You have a smooth distribution of gas and not packets of clumps of gas, as you would expect if you don't have a molecular zone. If you get like clouds being fueled one after the other, so that change something which appears to be very important for AGN, which is the duty cycle. So how much of your lifetime of AGN you spend on or off, and how much this um, this feedback can be can affect your galaxy if it's continuous or if it's um, discrete timing if you want. I see. So I have a question on the definition of the feedback. So by feedback, do you mean only stellar feedback or both stellar and AGN feedback? And does stellar feedback include thermal feedback or only or also kinetic feedback? So uh, it really depends on what you're talking to. Uh, but in general, everything I said on the mechanical thermal effect of feedback is whatever feedback. It's something that you inject from, from a specific location. The main difference between AGN and, and stellar feedback is of course, AGN is uh, limited to the galactic center while uh, stellar feedback could be anywhere where you form stars. Uh, so it's really dependent on, on the scales on the, and the location of what you are talking about in the galaxy. And for the different um, component of feedback, it's it's all the same also. It's uh, uh, what, what I've talked about, I didn't make a very strong the distinction between all the different feedback uh, ingredients um, because it's not fully understood what 
their relative role is. We know that presupposed feedback is very important. It could change your feedback budget and energy if you compare to supernova only, etc. But it's still not totally clear how much and how fast this affects your results. Because again, it depends on the physical condition you are in. So basically on the properties of your star forming region. Okay. So you have a question on cold disk. So what is your take on the surprisingly cold disk that are being discovered at high redshift? So with IRV sigma than expected, so a series of paper, Nilman, Rizzo, do you think such disk in your simulation, um, do you find such disk in your simulation? Is that also an effect of the higher gas fraction? Uh, I don't really know. So I don't find this in my simulations. Uh, so I made, I made two types of simulation that I reach if they are cosmogical or uh, isolated disk. And I set up what I want with isolated disk. It's kind of cheating. But uh, even in, in cosmogical, I don't really see that. Is that dependent on gas fraction? I, I'm not sure. I would say probably yes, in the sense that a different gas fraction could affect your instability regime and therefore how, how clumpy your gas becomes and how clumpy your feedback becomes. And I think that the trick is really to balance the gravitational effect and the feedback effect into getting uh, things relatively cold early uh, I mean, at, at high rate shift and not as you expect at uh, below rate shift one in, uh, in the Milky Way light galaxy. So I don't know, I'm not sure about that. I haven't, I, I don't know about these papers, but I would say it's probably come through the instability of your disk, which uh, again is part of the cycle between the regulation by feedback and by uh, gas fraction. Okay. That, that's my guess, right? Don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> So you have a question which is on the first part of the talk. Mm -hmm. How could the IMF change at higher mass and switch from top EV to bottom EV IMF? So from top EV to bottom EV IMF. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't really think we know that. Uh, what has been, so I guess this, uh, this question is about the capillary measurements, I think 2010. Uh, when you get, uh, so which one is it? You get bottom EV IMF in early type, massive early type galaxies, if I remember well. Uh, we don't really know why. My, again, my guess, my intuition is that if you get a massive early type galaxy or elliptical galaxy, it's probably has gone through a phase of major mergers, major galaxy mergers. And uh, I've, I worked quite a lot on, on interesting galaxies and mergers. And I see that the physical condition in the tertiary medium changes so much there that if this condition propagates down to the subparsic scale, then it will affect the SM. That's basically what I've illustrated with these different type of turbulence, hmm. um, these two movies. So in, in, if I go a bit more into details. Uh, in the Milky Way light galaxy, you get two thirds of your turbulence energy in this mixing mode and one third in compression. And what we have found with simulation is that at parsec scale in interacting galaxies, it's the opposite. You get more compression than mixing. And that's why you get the starburst activity. Now the, the whole game is to know if this difference propagates down to the stellar scale. So pre-stellar cores basically. If it does, then you expect a bottom heavy IMF. It's coming from a uh, time scale arguments. And, and then that could explain what we see in uh, massive ethical galaxies. Mm -hmm. But there is a huge if uh, in between because we have to go from what we see in simulation at parsec scale to what actually matters for the pre-stellar course and the mapping into stars at mm -hmm. smaller scales. And the first part of the question to uh, which higher mass can be the IMF? Ah. Uh, oh, I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can propose we switch to the coffee room so you can enter, uh, um, directly interact with Florent. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's meet, let's meet there. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for the talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>